We are back and are glad that you have decided to join us for another great episode of Global and the Granite State Podcast, program of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. I am Tim Horgan, the Executive Director of the Council and producer of these episodes. We are so excited to bring you two interesting new interviews today with an overall focus on Africa for this month. First, we hear from Susan Stignett from the U.S. Institute of Peace about the transition to democracy that is underway in Sudan. We then speak with Rain for the Sahel and Sahara to learn about their work in Niger, as well as what the facts on the ground are surrounding COVID-19 in the area. We hope that you find these discussions enlightening and fun, and hope that you will consider rating our podcast and leaving us a comment. Please do share this episode with your friends. Let's dive right in. The transition that's taking place in Sudan is an opportunity to solidify peace in a region that's important for national security for the U.S. for a number of reasons. This is Susan Stignett, the Director of Africa Programs at the United States Institute of Peace. Susan oversees programming in South Sudan, Nigeria, Sudan, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, and Kenya, and with the African Union. She focuses on the design and implementation of inclusive constitutional reform and national dialogue processes. Prior to joining the Institute of Peace, she managed constitutional development, citizen engagement, and election observation programs with the National Democratic Institute. From 2005 to 2011, she served as program director with the National Democratic Institute in South Sudan, where she supported the implementation of the peace agreement. She joined me to talk about the transitional government in Sudan and where the country is one year after the ouster of President al-Bashir. First, this was a citizen-led uprising that paves the way towards a potential democracy in a place where we had a dictatorship for over 30 years, where there was a genocide in Darfur, and in a region that has been a strategic U.S. partner for various efforts for peace and security, including counterterrorism efforts in Somalia and beyond that. You may remember, in December of 2018, the people of Sudan rose up against their long-term dictator, who was regarded as one of the more brutal leaders around the world. Omar al-Bashir certainly earned his title of dictator through a number of various means. President Bashir had a pretty storied 30-year ruling in Sudan. I think maybe the highlight that's a low light was his incredible ability to maintain coherence and to govern with a very strong hand. And that came at a terrible expense. I think the one that's probably most prominent for Americans is a conflict in Darfur that was designated as a genocide that led to significant mobilizations in campuses and universities and faith-based communities across the United States and around the world that grew out of and continued to be a civil war that actually continues today and that is being negotiated in this moment as part of the transition. There was an ongoing civil war between Sudan and then what was then southern Sudan, now South Sudan as an independent country. This was another topic that I think captured the hearts and the minds and the ideals of Americans. Southern Sudanese fought for, struggled for independence to try to protect their ability to exercise religion in the way that they wanted, to have freedom and exercise rights, to have their own government that had its own judiciary in the three branches that I think was many ways inspired by America and its democracy. So I think actually one of the successes was that, in fact, President Bashir ultimately went forward with the negotiation and respected the South Sudan referendum and allowed South Sudan to secede. That's become a pretty tragic story in many ways, but that's probably a topic for, for another conversation. Not only has the secession of South Sudan caused challenges for this new country, it was one of the precursors to the protests that ousted al-Bashir. After the country separated, Sudan's economy took a hard hit as they lost their oil reserves when South Sudan gained statehood. This led to the increase in price of basic goods, like bread, 
as well as the overall cost of living. However, it wasn't just these issues that led to the overthrow of this tyrannical government. The protest that we saw in Sudan in 2018, I think, is part of a broader trend that we see around the world with social movements really pushing for political transitions and change. We saw it sort of take form, but it is something that had really grown over several years. If we look back to 2013, there had been large protests in Khartoum that were dealt with with a very heavy hand. Over 200 people were killed at that time. And we know now that a lot of organizing started to take place with the reestablishment of unions that had been decimated and had been captured by the regime in the past. Through organizing of these neighborhood resistance committees that came together, young people who wanted to see a change and were ready to drive that from the grassroots up. With the Sudan Professional Association, which was sort of the umbrella group that helped to coordinate doctors and teachers and professionals and to really bridge across generations, young people and older people, people who lived through past popular uprisings in Sudan that engaged across genders, men and women. Women were really visible in the uprising and that engaged across geography. In the past, many times, politics has sat within Khartoum in the capital. For the first time, um, in a very visible way, it connected people in Darfur and in other areas of the country that have been marginalized. There was a really famous moment when protesters in Khartoum said you know, that actually President Bashir tried to blame Darfur for what was taking place. And there was a heavy crackdown and protesters in Khartoum started saying, we are all Darfur. You arrogant leader, we are all Darfur. And so the tactics that people used, they held this sit-in that was really a turning point because they negotiated with the military to get access to a military establishment and held their sit-in right in that space. So this was an area, you couldn't even drive a car down there. There were so many barriers and you know, hundreds and thousands of people sat in this space for day after day after day. Speaking of the military, as with many popular uprisings around the world, they played key role in turning against the government and protecting the protesters from other, more loyal, security services. This helped to turn the tide. However, the story does not end there. I think the other thing that was really interesting that the movement did, and what we've seen now, is that they negotiated with the security forces. That the military that essentially led the initial coup, the citizens didn't leave the square and the sit-in once Bashir was gone. It was clear to them that they were fighting for freedom, they were fighting for peace, they were fighting for something different. And they looked to what had taken place in Egypt. They saw some of the mistakes that took place, just getting rid of one leader, and they were really clear their efforts weren't to allow space for another type of authoritarian leader to come in. They were asking for a fundamental change of what government and governance looks like. And so I think they've, they've tried to carry that through and, and we see those negotiations between the civilian and the security elements of the, the government every day in a really challenging sort of way. Many people may not understand the security situation in Sudan, which Susan outlines here. The picture of the security elements in Sudan is really complicated. There's the military, the Sudan Armed Forces, that looks like more of a regular military. And then there are the police. There was the National Intelligence and Security Services that had large weapons, significant authority, and was really the engine of some of the repression that took place under President Bashir, um, and had grown to have really significant influence and reach across the country. And then you had these paramilitary groups that were more associated with individual political leaders, and perhaps most famously, the Rapid Support Forces, which were sort of the second to the Janjaweed that people will have heard about from the Darfur days. And so this security landscape, it's not just a military, and is incredibly complex in terms of the various players there. With that understanding, it makes it all the more impressive that the civilian military pact continues to hold today although it has not been without problems. What really led to this interesting compromise and almost people sometimes call it a power sharing agreement between the security and the civilian elements of the government was that there was an effort to break up the civilian sit-in in early June of last year. A terrible set of violence, just sort of the worst, worst things that humans can do to humans. And a moment where I think the civilians who had really been committed to nonviolence were shocked that that type of force was brought against them again. And at the same time when that took place, the military and security actors got a lot of pushback from the United States, from Europeans, and from their partners in the Gulf, from the Emiratis and the Saudis. And they realized that they had overplayed their hand. 
that they couldn't continue to rule in the same way that Bashir had ruled in the past. And they needed to find some way of compromise because it was clear the civilians weren't going anywhere. They didn't have the power to overthrow, but they had the power to be entirely disruptive. And so in the, the month following that, the civilians, after the internet was turned off, after they barely had cell phone capacity to connect with each other, after people had been entirely terrorized, they coordinated one of the largest marches and protests and showed that they weren't going away. And the military and security elements knew that they needed the legitimacy of this broad popular civilian movement to be recognized by the international community. And so this forced, I think, in, in a really tricky sort of way, a negotiation to to come together. And I don't think it's settled. This is probably a transition that typifies every transition where every single decision is this negotiation of who has which power and who can exercise it. Once all sides came to the table in June, a deal was hammered out to share power until the country was ready for democracy. As of right now, elections are scheduled for October of 2022, seemingly a long way away. However, as Susan notes, there are three keys that need to occur in order for a successful transition to democracy. The agreement that was negotiated is premised on a structure that has a so-called technocratic government led by a prime minister and a cabinet that is responsible for implementing the transition period. There was an agreement for a 36-month transition period. Sudan is interesting because often we think about the idea of a long transition is a bad idea. But in fact, in this case, the civilian elements and the political elements want a longer transition because they think that's needed to give them the greatest possible chance to level the playing field so that when it comes to elections, which is what will end the transition period, there's a chance that they can actually be competitive in that electoral process. So you have the cabinet that is technocratic. There is something called the Sovereign Council. It's a body that's composed of representatives from the security elements and from the civilian elements. They have sort of a formal head of state authority. Currently, it's chaired by somebody selected from the security elements. That will shift and flip over halfway through the transition. So it's a really important marker in the transition to see if indeed agreement can be reached on a civilian leader in that head of state function and how that will be negotiated and how the military and security elements can feel confident that they'll continue to have a role. And the third critical piece in that structure is a legislative council. And that does what we would imagine a legislative council will do, but to really provide the political vision to pass legislation, particularly legislation that would roll back some of the more repressive legislation, both in terms of religious rights and freedoms, in terms of political participation, broadly on rights and freedoms. And so that's the role of the legislative council. Um, the first priority in the transition is to negotiate peace agreements with Darfur and what we call the two areas, Southern Kordofan, Blue Nile. And that was supposed to happen very quickly, um, probably <laughs> unrealistically quickly, and precede the formation of the Legislative Council. Now, there's a hope that those peace agreements will actually be signed in time for the one-year anniversary of this constitutional declaration this August. But I think it's a good lesson that all of these transition steps take more time than we actually recognize. Um, and there's that constant tension of making progress, but giving the necessary time to have meaningful progress. With the basic structure in place for the transition, what are some of the challenges that this government will have in staying on track and moving things towards a democratic system? There are a lot of points where the transition could go off track. I do think that there has been a visible commitment to date to navigate and negotiate through those points. And I do think there's a really critical role for the international community to play to set up some of the guardrails for that transition to make sure that it moves forward as effectively as possible. I think the one year mark of this government will be a real test. Like in the United States, when a president reaches the first year of his term or her term, people expect to see things change. They expect to see that their lives are better. They expect to see that there's been meaningful progress. And the transition government has faced a lot of uphill challenges. You know, the economic crisis that sparked the protests in the first place, it continues to deteriorate. And I was in Sudan in March, and there were the longest lines I've ever seen, people waiting to get gas. The inflation rates are just out of control. And then you have the COVID-19 pandemic that's overlaid on top of this. So I think we have to keep looking towards that sort of one-year mark and how the government is doing on its strategic communication and its ability to deliver. 
I think a second phase will be in that turnover in the sovereign council, moving from a military to a civilian leader and getting agreement on that. And then I think leading into the elections will be a number of steps that are real tests. The civilian movement, the social movement and the umbrella that came together to lead the uprising is composed of political parties. And at some stage, those parties are going to reorient their attention towards running for elections. And that will become quite competitive. And there will be a lot of power alignment that takes place in those moments. And so I think that's something to watch towards that will be really critical. So... How does the U.S. Institute of Peace fit into this whole situation? Sudan is a place where I think we have the privilege of working from what we call sort of bottom up and top down. From the bottom up perspective, USIP seeks to advance our mission by empowering and working directly with peace builders, by training and skills, connecting them together with other people's experiences, providing them platforms to connect with each other, and connecting them up with decision makers. And so in Sudan, we work with a group called the Sudan Coaches Network for Change, and they draw on the principles of nonviolent action. So something we've heard a lot about in the last several weeks from Mr. John Lewis and what he inspired in the U.S. civil rights movement. They use those same principles to think about how they can shift power nonviolently. And those groups were really fundamental in driving a bottom-up change in Sudan. They are now pivoting to start to think about what it means to do civic engagement. So how do citizens engage with the government and hold it accountable to deliver the basic services citizens expect? And how do they drive a conversation about what the relationship is between citizens and their government? And then we're connecting that up with some of the work we're doing on the top-down side. And in that space, one of the tasks in front of the transitional government is to develop its new national security strategy. And this is a moment to think about how they can define a vision for the country. In the past, the security sector was something that people ran away from. Now there's a moment to think about how do you get a security sector that will actually protect citizens and that will be an example of the type of civilian-led democracy that the Sudanese struggled and rose up to try to achieve. So we're working with the committee that's leading that work to share experiences from other parts of Africa about how you can use this moment of a national security strategy to have a dialogue and really forge this kind of state society relationship, a social contract that we know is the most effective antidote to any sort of violence, any sort of extremism, and I think gives the greatest possibility for peace going forward. Thank you to Susan Stignat for speaking with me and sharing her great insights into this important topic. The more we know about what is going on in the world around us, the better prepared we are to face its challenges. education and how climate change, COVID-19, food security, diversification of the economy, weak governance, jihadists. These are some of the main challenges that Rebecca Black and Susan Fine identified as the biggest impediments of development in the Sahel and Sahara areas of Africa. I spoke with them, both board members of RAIN for the Sahel and Sahara, along with Catherine Colios, RAIN's executive director, to get a better insight into the region that this New Hampshire-based nonprofit works in. I think across that region, you see, because of the impact of climate change, you see a situation where communities that were already sort of living on the margin in terms of agriculture production, food security, are being pushed even further to the margin. And these are areas that already have lagged behind in development for many, many years. Susan Fine began her career as a Peace Corps volunteer and ultimately spent 30 years with the U.S. Agency for International Development, including two years as Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator responsible for developing policy and representing the U.S. in multilateral forums. Susan led USAID's technical and logistical support to Southern Sudan's 2001 self-determination referendum. As mission director for Senegal and the Sahel, she guided a groundbreaking resilience program in Niger and Burkina Faso. 
Niger is nearly at the bottom of the human development index, and a number of the other countries in the region are close. So one of the challenges is that you're having people and communities that are increasingly vulnerable to different kinds of shocks, whether they be climate-related shocks, floods, droughts, locust infestations, as is happening in East Africa. And then also, you know, the other real challenge is weak governance and quite honestly a lack of confidence on the part of the population in their government and also in the ability of their government to provide physical security, access to justice. And I think that that aspect is also driving serious extremist challenge in the region. Rebecca elaborated on the challenges of violent extremism in the region for us. So you see the same kind of international forces playing out in these countries within their borders, but really dealing with a lot of issues which are far beyond their borders. This is Rebecca Black. Rebecca recently returned to the U.S. after 25 years with the United States Agency for International Development. Most recently, she was mission chief in Cambodia, managing a diverse assistance portfolio with emphasis on governance and health. Prior to that, she served as the mission chief in Mali during a period of turmoil following a coup d'etat and rebel takeover of the northern two-thirds of the country. Uh, So it's gotten worse. When I was in Mali, I was able to travel everywhere. Now it's quite unstable. Even within the main capital city in Niger, which was stable for a while, is now beginning to see incursions from Nigeria with Boko Haram and those groups, and also from the northern part. It's a problem for the countries, how to deal with it. It's heavy involvement with the West, with the French and Americans, also creates a backlash. On top of all of this, the world has been dealing with a pandemic that has never before been seen. However, the central and eastern parts of the African continent have not been hit as hard as the rest of the world. Why might it be that these countries, who lack advanced healthcare systems, are faring better than many countries in North America and Europe? Part of that is governments did act very quickly. There was a lead time, which Europe didn't necessarily have, to take action. But as soon as cases started to arrive, which were from Europe and the U.S., Almost all the countries shut down their borders, they shut down their airports, they shut down transportation routes, they sent out messages using people on bicycles and on motorcycles and using radio and whatever media to talk about social distancing, to talk about hygiene. So now that things are opening up, there is a concern that it'll get much, much worse, and there's still predictions about a terrible pandemic throughout the continent. I would guess it'd be somewhere in between. It will get worse on the health side, but not as bad as some of the worst predictions, just because governments have taken action. There is experience from Ebola, from HIV AIDS, pandemics of governments of how to deal with these communicable diseases. As Rain for the Sahel and Sahara works specifically in Niger, Catherine Colios, executive director, was able to give us some on-the-ground insights of what their response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been. The Western media really warned of catastrophe before COVID hit in Africa, and I've been really impressed to see the response in Niger. The first case was in late March. I believe it was a man who came over a land border on a bus, and the same night that he came into Niger, I was already receiving messages from my colleagues, and immediately within 24 hours, the government was taking action. They closed the land borders, they limited transportation within the country, they asked people if they could to please stay home, if they had to go out to wear masks and maintain distance, and they acted pretty swiftly to shut schools from kindergarten through university. And I think that this rapid response was really effective in being able to stem the spread of the virus, which of course has been important in countries all over the world, but particularly in a country like Niger, which doesn't have the same medical infrastructure that we do here, to be able to stop the spread was really the key. Some of you may not be familiar with the great efforts of this local organization, which is doing amazing international work. RAIN partners with rural and nomadic communities across Niger to enable enduring livelihoods through education and opportunity. So essentially we work with these communities to ensure that they have the the skills and the infrastructure to meet their current needs and to, to lay the foundation for them to meet those needs in the future as well. This is an impressive objective for such a small organization. With only eight staff members spread between their New Hampshire and Niger operations, They have worked with hundreds of Nigerians in dozens of communities across the country. We have three main areas of programming. 
One is that we help ensure communities can access safe and sufficient water and nutritious food, and we provide the infrastructure such as wells and irrigation for them to continue to do that long term. We also work with women to provide basic training in finance and entrepreneurship so they can earn a living to support themselves and their families. And finally, we partner with the community to enroll children in school and to provide them with the support that they need to stay in school and to succeed. How then has this organization done so much with so little? 100% of RAIN staff in Niger is Nigerian. It's very important to us that the people not only running our programs, but planning our programs and leading that work understand the communities that they're working with. Not only are our staff Nigerian, but almost all of them have grown up in circumstances very similar to the communities they're working in. They're virtually all from rural areas. Many of them are from you know, nomadic tribes. Um, Niger, it's an enormous country. You know, in, in the U.S., we have a tendency to sort of conflate different countries in Africa, but Niger alone, it's about 50 times the size of the state of New Hampshire. And there are about 20 million people. And the peoples there are very diverse. And so our staff really represent that variation. We have staff that follow different religions. We have staff that speak all kinds of different local languages. And so all of those experiences help them, I think, to really relate to the communities that they serve and also for the communities to really trust and open up to them. And that's critical. All of our programs start before we even decide to implement a program in a community. We sit down with community leaders and community members and we find out if the work that we do is aligned with their vision for what their needs are and for how they'd like to solve the challenges in their community. And we really don't move forward in a community unless we feel that the community wants us to be there. At this point, we have strong enough relationships in the communities where we work that often surrounding communities will hear about our work through their neighbors and they'll often come to us and say, you know, we heard that you're doing this agriculture project. We'd love to have a community garden here. Is that something you'd be able to do? And so we really try to let the communities lead the way, both in terms of where we work and how we implement our projects there. Not only is this important to the success of RAIN in Niger, but also speaks to the reasons as to why people support their efforts in the first place. I think it was one of the most important things for me when I first started learning about RAIN, that it was very driven by what was going on in Niger by Nigerians. And it was not creating a one-off project like building a school and then sort of leaving it for people to take care of afterwards. It really was about working with communities, with the government, with the school system as it was and helping improve it, helping girls get access to it. So for me, it was a really critical part of being engaged with RAIN is this commitment to really have it be led by the people who, in the end, will be the ones who benefit and will need to sustain whatever is done through RAIN. In addition, this approach helps RAIN fit into the wider international development field to provide a personal touch that larger organizations cannot work in. Without great organizations like this on the ground, creating the environment for wider community growth, the larger international aid organizations would not be as successful and vice versa. The organizations that are working with countries and people like Niger and Nigerians on their development journey as kind of an ecosystem. And you have, of course, the large international donors and international organizations they play an important role, and there are reasons in some instances why they impose certain approaches, certain sectoral priorities, certain policies. However, I think that ultimately to achieve the kind of a sustainable development that most people around the world are aspiring to, you really need all these different actors with different capabilities. And there are some really unique capabilities of a small organization like RAIN that's very connected to the communities that's essentially supporting and giving capacity to the communities to implement their own priorities. And it's an important role and they fit within the broader ecosystem. Within that ecosystem, RAIN has created a broad range of programs that are affecting the people of Niger every day. This is just one example of how they create the space for success. Earlier this year in the fall, we were preparing to do recruitment for the Agadez Learning Center, which is one of our middle school programs. And typically the person who heads that recruitment is the director of the learning center. Unfortunately, in September, he had a stroke. And so the staff came together really rapidly to come up with a new recruitment process. 
And one of the things that we brought in that we had never done before is we decided to use alumni from the Learning Center to help with recruitment. And so one of the alumni who came back, Maude, he was in his first year of university at the University of Agadez studying environmental studies and biology. And it was incredible to see him go out into the community because, as I mentioned before, we work with these underrepresented minority groups. And Maude in particular is a Fulani Wadabi, which is the ethnic group that has the worst education outcomes in Niger. In the entire University of Agadez, he was one of only two Wadabi Fulani students. And so for him to be able to go back into these communities and to talk to parents and for not just us and for not just the staff to say, you know, here's what we think we can do for your children. But for parents to see this person say, I come from this neighboring community, I went to this program, and now in this entire university, I'm one of just two people from our ethnic group who's made it that far. You could see almost the cogs turning in people's minds that this isn't just something that we're offering, it's something that they've seen to work. We learned a lot from the experience about the importance of that representation, which I think intellectually we all know, right? We talk here all the time about the importance of seeing people like you in these positions of success and of leadership. And I think for our partner communities to see someone who went through the process and who sort of came out the other side and to see that person as one of their, their peers, I think was incredibly meaningful. In Niger, even just finishing middle school puts you in, you know, sort of the top tier in terms of how educated you are in the country. And so for him to then go on and complete high school and then go on and continue to university, I think is really both a testament to how long we've been doing this work, right? And then sort of the longevity of, of the outcomes. And it's really that sort of community impact, right? Where it's not just about that one person, it's about what happens now that he's gone on to university and what does he do with his life? Right? And what does having him succeed in that way do for other people right, from his home community or from similar communities? As you may have noticed from previous episodes, New Hampshire has a large number of internationally minded organizations based here in the state. Many people do not think of New Hampshire as a very global state, but this certainly does not ring true in our work or in the work of many organizations you will find here. There's maybe a perception, and I guess I'm guilty of having had that perception, that New Hampshireites are somewhat insular, but clearly that is not the case. As the more people that I meet around my community here and around the state, it's very clear that people are well-informed, they're interested, they're engaged in issues, of course, in their local communities, but beyond their local communities. And there's a growing appreciation for the fact that the world is interconnected, and I think this pandemic <laughs> illustrates that better than anything else. And, and people understand that we cannot continue to function with the assumption that things that happen in a place like Niger are not going to impact us in some way. The people I've met here have had extraordinary lives and extraordinary careers. Many of them have been international facing. And I think that that is a little bit maybe beneath the surface of what people see when they look at New Hampshire, but I think it, it's very much present. The last word goes to Susan, as she perfectly articulates my own thoughts on the subject of U.S. global leadership. Many people simply state that if the U.S. was less involved internationally, the world would be a better place. It's important for us to understand that it's one thing we can step back, but somebody else will step forward to fill that vacuum. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that who steps forward may not be somebody who is driving global trends and responses in a way that is beneficial to our country. Thank you to Susan Fine, Rebecca Black, and Catherine Colios of Rain for the Sahel and Sahara for this wonderful discussion. We are so happy to be able to highlight such great organizations working to make the world a better place from right here in New Hampshire. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Global and the Granite State podcast. We at the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire really appreciate your interest and your support. Please remember to rate this episode, leave a comment, and share our work with your friends. Also, let us know what topics you would like to learn about in the future. We would be happy to have your suggestions. Our theme music is Admin from AA Alto. Our interview music is A Sudanese Backyard Garden by No Monster Club and West Africa by John Bartman. This has been the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire's Global in the Granite State Podcast.